Okay, so let's return to our main text, Galatians chapter 4 again. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 26. Now, this is apparent. We know that what Paul's saying about Jerusalem is definitely heaven now. Because look at verse 27. But Jerusalem, which is above, see that? He's talking about all the way up there, that Jerusalem. So that has to be heaven. Is free. That's right. We're free from the law. Jerusalem is free. Which is the mother of us all. So Paul says that Jerusalem is our mother homeland. Now the one people, group of people who are so weird that comes out saying that God has a wife. And it's like, what? God? Yeah, you got a spiritual mother. We're like, what in the world? And then this is their verse. See, Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all. Now, I already explained to you what this was. This was talking about like a mother homeland. See? Have you ever heard of, you know, people talking about Mother Russia? or that America is my mother homeland, and et cetera, et cetera. Places are naturally referred to as our mother. Why? Because we were born from there. That's the idea. By the way, Paul told you a long time ago at verse 24, it's an allegory. See, that's the danger of literal interpretation. Literal interpretation can make you produce heresies, like this kind of mother of, uh, this church of the God or mother God weird movement out there. And these people are claiming there is a literal mother God. No, it's an allegory, okay? You didn't even read verse 24. You're just search wording everything that says mother, and you're hoping by chance you'll hit one of those verses that we have a spiritual mama out there, man. So this is their problem. Now look at Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 21. Look at right here. This Jerusalem is going to be for us. Revelation calls this the New Jerusalem. So this is going to be our place, our mother home, where we're going to reign forever. Place for Christians. What a wonderful day. Man, I want to thank God that there is no mother God, but rather a mother homeland for me where I can live and inhabit, man. Thank God for that. All right, so let's look at Revelation chapter 21. Notice what the Bible says right here, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So notice that this is referring to the bride of Christ, New Jerusalem. It's assimilated with the bride of Christ. Look at verse 9. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Who is she? Verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So notice that the new Jerusalem, it's referred to the mother for Christians and the wife of God. You might say, why is that? Because this is all assimilated together with Christians. Because Christians are known as the wife of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. That's found at Ephesians chapter 5. Some of these people would like to say, no, this is referring to a mother God out there. Mother God at Revelation chapter 21. Well then, if that is, my, if that is God's wife, I guess God has a weird infatuation with having his wife to be a thing. Some object. Isn't that weird? So you tell that church group, don't you think you're a strange, weird little cult to say that God, he has, some, he has a wife relationship with an object? You tell them that. Make them, let, let them see how strange and weird their little cult is right there. So watch out for this church of God people. These guys, they are dangerous people that are trying to, uh, they are actually working really hard evangelizing, grouping people. They're joining what the Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons are doing. So every time you see one at the airport or going around in campus, don't think that it's a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon. You'd be surprised. It's one of these weird people. So keep an eye out for those guys. Okay, let's return to our main text, Galatians. Galatians. Chapter 4. So the reason why it's known as the wife of God, mother, is, and is because it's always, notice, connected to Christians. It's all a spiritual entanglement spiritually all the same together. That's the reason why. 
And you saw so far right here from the Bible where Paul was explaining it as an allegory. Okay, let's return to Galatians 4 verse 27. For it is written, so Paul's quoting from the Old Testament, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. So the woman who is barren, who is not able to bring forth children, you can rejoice now. Break forth and cry. So now you can give birth now. That's why they can cry. Thou that travailest not. You used to not travail before. Cry out. Be in grief when you give birth before. But now you can travail. You can give grief because you are pregnant. You're going to give birth. For the desolate hath many more children. People who are desolate, who have no children. They now have a lot more children than she which hath an husband. Than those who do have an husband. So now... The Bible is quoting right here that you're going, to get, bring, you're going to bring forth more children than ever before, even though, that you didn't, even though you didn't have a husband before, even though you were barren. Now, what verse is Paul quoting from? He's quoting from the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 1. Look at Isaiah, chapter 54, and verse 1. This is why hyper-dispensationalists also have this problem. When you remember allegorical interpretation, this is going to be effective against hyper-dispensationalists. Hyper-dispensationalists, they think this. Everything has to be literal, as the verse says, and then if it doesn't apply to me, then it cannot apply to me. So it has to apply to a Jew. But that's the problem. Paul, your Apostle Paul, as you hyper-dispensationalists like to call him, our beloved Apostle Paul, our Apostle Paul, our Apostle Paul. That's their catchphrase. Whenever you hear that, kind of be on your toes for these guys. It is true, Paul is our Apostle, but look, we don't say that like a, like a parrot, our Apostle Paul, our Apostle Paul, our, we, we don't act like parrots doing that. So if you hear somebody doing that, they, they learned it from somebody else. They were parroting from somebody else, okay? So anyways, the Apostle Paul, he was using an Old Testament verse and applied it to the Christian church. Amen. What do you mean there's no Old Testament verse that doesn't apply to us? Look at this, man. Look at the book of Isaiah. Look what Paul did right here. Paul, he was quoting from an Old Testament passage, and you can see right here that he was not a hyper-dispensationalist. Verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now, if you keep reading from verses 1 and onward, that was referring to the nation of Israel. That is doctrinal, that is literal, that is prophetic, that has no application to the Christian church. But Paul, he takes this passage and applies it to the Christian church. So you can tell your hyper-dispensationalist friend here that, um, so Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1, so we can't make that an allegorical spiritual interpretation, right? Uh, no, it's got to be doctrinal and literal. Okay, then, then Paul was using this verse as a doctrinal, literal application to the Christian church in your Old Testament. That don't make things better. <laughs> that makes things worse for the hyper-dispensationalists. So why did Paul quote this Old Testament verse? Very simple. The reason why is because the Bible is not limited to doctrinal, literal interpretation. Again, what is it bound as well? Symbolic, allegorical, spiritual interpretations. Look at the book of 1 Timothy. Look at the book of 1 Timothy. It is very important to understand this. Got to watch out. If you don't believe in this kind of interpretation, you see where it does lead down to a trail of heresy. It will lead you down to a trail of heresy where it is actually hyper-dispensationalism or, or the Catholic Church with their mass or some kind of weird mother of God movement that think that God has a literal mother out there. Just so strange. Okay, so actually 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, verse 16. It is important to understand that in Bible rules that we use all of the Bible. You know what dispensationalists believe? Not the Apostle Paul's writings only. It's all of the Bible. Amen. All, all of the Bible divided doctrinally to the right group of people, right time period, spiritually in the right sort of application, devotionally in the right application, etc. That's a true Bible believer. 
Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture, did it say some or all? All is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, but not just doctrine, for what as well? <laughs> for reproof, excuse me, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And that's your beloved Apostle Paul saying that. So watch out for these hyper dispensations. Oh, pastor, I didn't like how you use that passage at the book of Hebrews or in the Old Testament. It has no application to us, blah, 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 blah. No, you better watch out for that. That's a hyper dispensational mindset. You better watch out for that mindset. Okay, so let's return to Galatians. If you don't like me, I'm going to tell you what. I'm more Pauline than you are. I followed the beloved, my beloved Apostle Paul more than you because the Apostle Paul was quoting Old Testament verses. So he was trying to apply, you can tell right here, he was using a spiritual application, not doctrinal, a spiritual application within the Old Testament to apply to the Christian church within this allegory about what? Now she can bring forth birth now, who, and before she couldn't. Remember Sarah, she was barren back then, but now there was a miracle where she can bring forth a child. So Paul was trying to relate to that fact. Look at verse 28. Okay, I got to close right here. I thought that I'd finish up to 5 verse 10, but I spent a lot of time. Okay, so let me wrap it up here. This is the end. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, so Paul's saying, all of us, as Isaac was, are the what? Children of promise. So that's your getaway. So we were guessing. We already knew where Paul was heading toward. He was trying to point out that this was referring to Isaac as the child of promise. That's who we are. Because back then, we were no children back then. We were barren. We didn't even exist. Why? Because God's people was the nation of Israel, Jews. Gentiles, Jesus said, I have nothing to do with you. But he was transferring, transitioning more and more to Gentiles. We were that children of promise by faith. That's us. Now, there's one more last thing that I want to say. There's a weird group of people you got to watch out for. And these people, they like to call themselves New IFB, King James only. And they'll teach you that the church goes through the tribulation and they are anti-Semitic. These guys, you wouldn't believe their interpretation. Because they strongly believe that the nation of Israel, that they are completely forsaken, that God won't forsake them, because they think the church is the actual nation of Israel, they're going to use this verse at verse 23 or 22 all the way to 30 to say, you know who the real Jews are? Us. Why? Because we came from Isaac. But look, these Jews who follow the Old Testament law, they're from Ishmael. Now, you won't believe what they say. So they seriously believe with a mental issue right here, even though you read the Old Testament. No one believes in that, not even atheists. These guys have a mental issue who think that Jews literally came from Ishmael. That's what they think. They think that the Jews in the nation of Israel today, that they're from Ishmael. Well, then who are the Muslims from? Where are the Muslims from? What in the world, man? And then they think that we Christians came from Isaac. Really, man? You're serious? genetically, racially, nationally, that don't make sense, dude. You are nuts. You are off your rocker. If you're watching those kind of preachers, unsubscribe, please leave them. That is a very serious mental disorder right there. I'm being serious right here. The easy answer to this, we repeated it over and over again. There's a danger with something literal. Remember that? If you keep doing things literally, you see how many heresies come out? What is the interpretation here? Paul repeated over and over again at verse 24. That I stress so much. Ah, allegory. Allegory. That's what Paul was driving at, okay? If you're going to take this as some doctrinal, literal interpretation, dude, you got a mental disorder right here. I mean, I, that don't make sense. So this is the passage where, by, where Paul is talking about right here where we became the actual Jews, what? Spiritually. Spiritually in God's family. Not physically, nationally, genetically, racially. No, that is totally different. By the way, the Bible mentions, I showed you over and over again from the passage, at the book of Galatians and even at the book of 
John, the four gospels, Jesus and Paul recognize that these Jews were what? They were God's people from Abraham by the flesh. They recognize that, see? 